Let's wait 50 sec 15, 15 seconds. <laughs> okay. So okay, I think that we can I think that we can we can start. So uh, thank you so much for being here, let's say. And hope you are fine and and safe and safe at home. So as I told you before, the idea with this seminar is just to uh, try to scare you a little bit about other diseases. So you are not thinking about coronavirus. That's the main, that's the main goal. And <clears throat> I think the, so tomorrow I'm gonna talk about a couple of uh, works we recently published with uh, people from Saragossa and also um, uh, fact that has been sort of like it's quite known at the Fisk and other couple of people from from Colombia, and the idea is just um, to try to extend the normal let's say models that we use for disease spreading because we, as you more or less can see right now, we start to be quite good at, um, um, for example, predicting one disease. Some models are better, some models are worse, but the idea is that. If we can predict one disease at a time, more or less models start to be reasonable, let's say. The problem is that usually uh, things are, in the real world, things are quite, be, quite more complicated than that, because what happens is that usually diseases just doesn't, uh, let's say, spread alone. There are some interactions with other diseases, or some diseases are just uh, produced by different strain of the different, on, on the same, uh, of different pathogens. So, Actually, there is a real competition to try to kill us. That's the main, that's the main point. So the problem is that we don't have enough models. We are starting to create these models right now, but we still, we still need lots of time, so lots of work. And the second part of the seminar is going to be around uh, another type of diseases, what are called vector-borne diseases, diseases that cannot spread from human to human, but they need a vector in the middle. For example, mosquitoes or some wild mammals or something like this. So also in this case, what happens is that we don't have, <clears throat> let's say, a extreme complicated models. We are starting right now. There are some stuff, but nothing, let's say, we, we need to work a, a lot on this. So let, usually I will start about a very long introduction about disease modeling and how this could be important, but I think in this case I can skip this part because probably given the recent, the recent what happened, what happened recently, I'm pretty sure that you're already well aware of these kind of things. So let me start with uh, just an example of, uh, of disease interaction. This is, okay, it's not working. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, now it's working. Okay, so the first example is something that I already put in my slides. So probably you already saw these kind of things like 10 times already, but the idea is, I put it because it's, I think it's quite an impressive case. Uh, in this map, what you can see is actually, this is the incidence of tuberculosis in Africa in the 90s. And this is the same map, something like 15 years later. But you can see uh, they are totally different. For example, there's been an explosion of tuberculosis in these areas in the South. And the main reason is that in the meantime, what happened is that uh, HIV arrived in, uh, arrived in Africa. And the combination with two diseases is something like it's quite, let's say, it's extremely good because what happens is that tuberculosis is a very, let's say, very strange disease because it's a bacillum that, uh, that, generate, that uh, generates it. And then what happens is that uh, uh, what you get is that it can be latent for a very long period of time. So before, uh, before actually developing the disease, you can have the bacillum inside you, but for very long time, but we are talking about more than 100 years. So the thing here is that, let me try, I will just mute you for a second. Okay, better? Okay, sorry, sorry also about that. And the idea is that uh, the period of time tuberculosis is extremely large, the, the Latin period. So what's happened is that most people just die before even developing the disease for the first time. And only if your, let's say, immune system is highly compromised, for example, you, you got HIV, the disease can actually develop and you can start having symptoms and suffering from it. And this is actually exactly what happens. So 
the WHO estimated that something like between 16 and 27 times it's the, it's the risk uh, greater than normal people, the risk if you have, uh, of contracting uh, tuberculosis if you already have HIV. So this explains this, this explosion, let's say. And the other example that I would like to show you is the other way around. How, how viruses, for example, are competing to, to kill you. Um, the best example probably is seasonal influenza because what happens every year is just there are several strains of, of influenza that there's, or the virus that, the, the virus that, um, that causes influenza that's, um, let's say, the spread at the same time. Actually, there are two main types of uh, viruses of influenza, and each type has some subtypes. For example, the, the type A are, has at least four different strains, and they also they mutate during the years. But the thing is that there is an interaction between, uh, between different strains, or the same strain that mutates from one year to the other. And actually, in this case, what happens is some sort of cross immunity. So if you already got the disease once, for example, from one strain, you are somehow immune because your immune system already recognizes, they already recognizes the, the virus, also to similar strains or the same strain that mutated during the years. So actually what happens, what we call seasonal influenza actually is something like a mixture of different viruses. For example, this is a, a table that I got from last year's season from ECDC. And what you can see is that actually there are at least four or five different strains of influenza circulating at the same time each one providing some sort of cross immunity between the others. And for example, what you see as last year, the most prominent was this one, was H1N1. That was the one that caused the pandemic in 2009. And, but also there were something like almost one third of the infections were due to the other type, uh, the other type A is something like H3N2. So actually we are seeing that there is a lot of, um, Really, the reality, the reality is quite complex. There are many strains competing with each other. So predicting, for example, what will be the main strains that are circulating in the next year, just for example, for vaccines, is something like it's quite, it's quite complicated, let's say. And in terms of models, the problem is that we are just at the beginning. So for example, there is this very nice uh, measure physics paper by Grassbegger from a from few years ago, from 2015, where they just study a very simple model. So uh, two diseases is spreading on the same network of, of contacts and uh, each one offers you some cooperative, let's say, some cooperative effect. So if you get one disease, your probability of getting the other is higher than the normal. And what we found actually, we found that actually they, this behavior, they found some very interesting behavior, behaviors because for example, they saw that the, the transition from the disease-free state to the, to the endemic state for the disease becomes uh, of the first order. So there is a huge jump. For example, there's an explosion in the number of cases. Once you put a seed, you see an explosion in the number of cases. This is something that it's not usual in normal, in normal models. And also, there's also this other interesting work by Castellano of, you, of a couple of years ago where what they did was trying to produce, to, to give, for example, a theoretical estimation of the point when you have this, this jump. So the simulations are in red and in blue, there is the, the theoretical estimate. As you can see, they can predict the change in the behavior, but the prediction in terms of the critical point are not, not so good. And more or less the same happens, for example, in the other case, in the case of competition, where People studied, for example, uh, what are the conditions for two diseases to compete, or to survive, but the problem is that uh, there isn't, let's say, a clear theoretical framework for all of these. So what I will try to do is, during the first part of this seminar, we'll try to introduce this framework that it's able to, let's say, to model all, all the cases from, from full cooperation to full competition and try to see what are the effects that we can, uh, if we can find new, new effects, or so for example, study the, study the condition for where two diseases can coexist as the same at the same time. To do that, the basic uh, framework that I'm gonna use is something that we published, oh shit, something like 10 years ago. And I started to, I'm starting to get told actually, but the idea is very simple. So it's a simple model of uh, just uh, one of the simplest epidemics, epidemic dynamics that you can find, the simple SIS model, 
on the network. So each node I here is not like a node in the network and you have here, you have the structure of the network for the interactions. And the idea is pretty simple. At rate P, one, um, uh, one is susceptible becomes infected and then the infected cure at rate, uh, at rate uh, R. And the basic idea is just to predict the the, frag the probability of one node of being infected at time t plus one is just uh, summing the probability of all the possible cases. So in this case, this is the probability of being infected at time t, of node i being infected at time t, plus the probability of uh, times the probability of not get cured in that uh, amount of time. This is the other way around. This is the probability of being susceptible, one minus rho, uh, times the probability of getting the disease. These this term here is something like it's something we're gonna see a lot during this seminar, but the idea is that this is the probability of not getting the disease from any of your neighbors. So one minus this thing is something like the probability of getting the disease. And this is and this is the last term, is something like I was infected, I get cured, and then I get infected again. So this is just for one disease. If you want to extend this to the case of something like two diseases, things start to be a little bit more complicated because right now each node of the network can be in two different states. So it can be, oh, sorry, can be susceptible in one case, uh, susceptible to one disease is uh, susceptible to the other or infected only of the first disease is susceptible to the other, the other way around or infected by both diseases. And then, so you have all the transitions. So you have two probabilities, the probabilities from getting the first disease, the probability of getting the second. And then we are adding also this term here, that represents the interaction between the two diseases. So it's this factor here that just weights the probability of getting the other disease once I have the first one. So in this case, with this parameter, I can control where I am. For example, if this parameter is larger than one, my probability of getting one disease once I have the other is way is higher than the normal. Or if it's smaller than one, the probability is lower. So actually, I mean, I'm studying competition between the two. And the idea will not just enter into details, but you can write more or less the same equations as before. They are quite more complicated, but the ingredients are exactly the same for the, all the possible cases. So actually these terms here are just the possible transition that you have. For example, if I want to get there, this is the probability that I will be here. I will be infected by both. I get cured by one, but they will not get cured by the other one. So I will just say, I will just arrive here. And these functions here that are in this part are just to tell you that, uh, uh, to take into account the fact that I cannot be get infected by the two diseases at the same time. It's really unlikely in the real world that I will get both diseases at the same time. So actually, when I get infected by two, I just pick up one of the, one of the two, let's say. So I will not, uh, as I told you, I will not go into details of all the, because they are quite simple even if they are long. Obviously you have the other way around for the other diseases, totally, is, in this case is totally symmetric. And then you have the last part where you actually get the, mm, where you actually, the way in which you get infected by, by both is a little bit simpler. But okay, let's go, let's try to see for example, uh, what happens with cooperation. So, in this case, what I have here is just Q equal to one in the sense that there is no interaction between the diseases. And what I do is that is if I just increase Q, what I see is that the, the transition becomes uh, steeper and steeper, let's say, until I get, uh, I get the jumps, uh, I get the jump that I was telling you before. But the good thing is that with this theory, the things that it's way more accurate than, than other approaches, because for example, the lines here, the dashed lines represents the iteration of the equations that I showed you before, while the points represent the, the points represent the, the numerical simulation, the Monte Carlo simulation. So it is quite a good agreement. And actually, if you go in this area, what you can see is also that, it, that there is B stability in the sense that this is a proper first order phase transition between the two, between the forward and the backward, and the backward loop. And actually what you can do as this, as you can solve the, the equations, the idea is that you can actually study the entire phase diagram. So here we have the probability of getting the disease and here we have the interaction Q. 
and actually you can also find the area where you have uh, where you have the stability and the critical point for the for the interaction to get the to get the stability but this was the case of cooperation what happened in the opposite case for example when you have uh, for example total cross immunity in this case actually what happens is that you cannot have both diseases at the same time so actually the other part the other the other compartment is not present and if you just plot the the incidence of the disease what you can see actually is that it's exactly the same the normal one that you you will always find for example for just one single disease actually the values are exactly the same that you will find in one single disease the only thing is that actually if you if we start to take a look let's say a deeper look of what what's happening inside at the microscopic uh, at the microscopic level what you find is actually is that things are a little bit more complicated than that because here i'm plotting just the difference between the two between the two diseases and what happens actually what you can see is that in this case in this part what's happened is that the number of infected is just the number of infect of just one disease meaning that there is one disease that is taking the control so it's infecting all the nodes that he, that he can find and and what happens is that the other one dies after this point here there's a sharp drop actually there is another another transition that we think is something like another first order but we have to, we still have to study well but yeah, is there is another sharp transition and what you get actually there is this part where the two diseases actually if you make the difference is almost zero meaning that actually the two diseases are just coexisting at the same time and also they are occupying they are occupying the same part of the network because in this case i choose so if i will try for example just to summarize in this case what happens is that we have an area where no one survives because the infectivity is too low for to infect a large part of the network then there is one area where actually what happens two stable points are, uh, appear but they are on the axis meaning that what's happening is that only one disease at a time can survive so which one you're going to survive is just a matter of initial conditions but you always end up in one of these two and then there is another part but actually both diseases are uh, can coexist and they are stable so they are going to be they are gonna they are gonna coexist for longer periods of time and another important thing that you can do for example with this framework is that you can try to calculate actually to estimate this uh, this critical point this the this second transition you can find here and the resolution actually i mean i will not show you the the derivation but it's pretty it's pretty straightforward the only problem is that actually it's a semi-analytical method because what happens is that to have this expression actually what i'm doing i'm linearizing so i have this linear system uh, i have this linear system here the only problem is that this linear system depends on the prevalence of just one of the of a uh, single disease in the system so it depends i put one disease i see what is the prevalence alone and then with that value I put it here and then what's happened i cancel the system so i can solve for pc and getting the value of the of the theoretical uh, theoretical estimation but the things that you can get actually this value you can study uh, for example how it changes with the network topology or the infectivity of the two the two diseases so let's say trying just to sum up the first part of the seminar then we move to something probably a little bit more scarier the idea is that we have this uh, this framework that allows us just to study, uh, let's say, in the entire uh, the entire spectrum from cooperation to competition. Actually, we see a lots of interesting stuff. For example, we got a first order phase transition, so a change in the in the phase transition when actually when you have cooperation. So we have explosive uh, you have explosive the, the diseases. While on the other side, what you have you have also the fact that there is the another transition here from let's say a part of full dominance where they coexist so actually you can actually study for example how many different extending this framework you can say for example how many strains of a disease can survive at the same time for example for studying the, the spreading of influenza or, or these kind of things so okay uh, this was the let's say the first part then <clears throat> let me try to move to 
to the second part about the modeling of vector board diseases. So actually diseases that are driven by vectors. Here I'm just depicting these mosquitoes because what happens is that they are responsible, some species of mosquitoes are responsible for many different uh, vector board diseases, but vectors actually can be, can be different things. For example, wild animals like, like wild mammals for Lyme disease and other and similar things. And here what I'm depicting, this is the area where, where this kind of mosquito is living right now around the world. So you can see mainly equatorial and tropical regions, but it also starts to live, for example, in the south of the United States. So this starts also even in some parts in the south of Spain and, and so on. And just to give you an idea of how these diseases are becoming, let's say, dangerous, this is the spreading of the this is just a chart from the WHO about the spreading of uh, the Zika virus in the last something like 50, 60 years, more or less. And the problem is, uh, actually, this is, actually it's quite interesting because now it's hard to see, but the first uh, countries to um, where the Zika has been detected is something like starting in 1947, and then almost nothing or just few things happens till 2014, and then all these other countries from here to here are the ones that have been that have been infected. I mean, the, the, the experience outbreaks just from 2015 to, to 2016. So also in this case, there have been an explosion in just few in just few years. So it start everything started uh, around Africa, especially in Uganda and these other parts of Africa. Then the virus didn't spread too much until 2012. And then from 2012 and so on, started and exploded, reached almost almost a large part of uh, large part of South America and Central Central America. And the problem with the disease is that it's not dangerous itself. Actually, it's something like a mild fever, two or three days. The only problem is that if you are if you are pregnant, well, if you are a woman, and if you are pregnant, the there is a high risk. Or especially at the beginning of the pregnancy, there is high risk of problems with a with a baby. For example, some some kind of malformations of this thing. So it's it's really so it's really important to let's say put it under control, especially uh, for for pregnant for pregnant women. And another thing that it's a little bit scary is the fact that actually with global change. Uh, the estimates saying that the population at risk of this kind of diseases, for example, this one is for dengue, another, another let's say, another vector-borne disease, but uh, uh, more or less is, the results are the same for the same type of, uh, of mosquitoes. The problem is that actually the population at risk of vector-borne diseases, in this case specific of dengue, in 2080, are estimated to increase by something like 2.25 billion people, reaching more or less the, the more than 60% of the predicted population at that time in the world. So we are talking about that we're gonna reach areas like the south of the United States, south of, uh, south of Europe, larger parts, for example, in, uh, in Australia, and larger parts also in the <clears throat> in uh, in America in the, in the Americas. So uh, there really starts to be, let's say, a problem. And how is possible that actually uh, something a mosquito that only lives few hundred meters because in the, their lifespan is really, really small, just few days, and in the entire life they move around no more than 700 meters. How is possible they can spread a disease like this? Through the entire world, and the idea actually is, it probably we should flip, let's say, our view around. We are the vectors that are spreading the disease, because we are moving uh, larger distances with shorter times. So actually, what happens is that we can export the disease from one country to other countries where the, where for example the the disease was not present. But also, another thing is that there are. This is minimal, but there are some mosquitoes that go also enter to airplanes, so travel with us to other places. And then if they found the good, they found good conditions, they can also replicate it there. So actually, we start to see some types of mosquitoes also in our, in, uh, for example, in, uh, in Europe and all these things. So the idea is that how can we 
model uh, these kind of things as a, of a such large scale. For those of you who were present on the seminar a couple of weeks ago, what we are going to use, what is called uh, multi-scale modeling or metapopulation, metapopulation models. So the idea is quite simple in the sense that you have a very simple epidemic dynamics. In this case, it's what is called the Ross McDonald uh, model, when there is nothing more than actually two coupled SIS dynamics. So you have a human that can be susceptible of infected and mosquitoes that can be susceptible or, um, or infected. And actually what happens is that mosquito, the mosquitoes just bite humans and then the humans can get the disease. Then uh, if a mosquito, if a susceptible uh, mosquito bites an infected human, they get the, the disease again. And then there is the entire circle. So actually what happens, humans, uh, humans recover, mosquitoes actually doesn't recover, but what happens is that we suppose that their population is somehow closed, so new mosquitoes enter in the, in the circle. So this is at the, the smallest level, the level of the single individual. Then what we want to do is just to model for example, populations. So we have different cities or different countries, each one with people living there, and then also they live with mosquitoes. Some areas have more mosquitoes than, than others. So actually, probably here, the, the prevalence of the incidence of the, the disease will be higher and cases can be exported to other, to other places. And the last ingredient is just, <clears throat> is just the fact that you have flows of people uh, moving around, so actually, it actually, it's us that is spreading the disease from different to different populations. And just to give you an idea, this is more or less a scheme of how how things works. Actually, I have to thank uh, Jesus Gomez Gardenas for uh, preparing these slides with all the animations. Probably took him uh, several days, but they are really nice. So the idea is, I have different populations. For example, I have population high and population J. And what happens is each one, each population has people living there. So this is just people living in, the, in this population. And what happens is that people just move. So for example, here I'm just messing with the, just messing with the name of the variables. Before P was the probability of getting infection. Now P is the probability of moving from one place to the other. Sorry for the inconsistency. But the idea is that obviously I have my probability of moving from one place to the other. And then the other thing is that I have flows. So I have a weighted network telling me people, the fraction of people that is going to this population, to this other population and, and back. So I have uh, my, my parameters still now are just the mobility and the network where people is moving with the flows with the number of people moving from one place to the other. And then what happens is that people moves and here, the, let's say the epidemic dynamics takes place. So these are the, parameter, the parameters of the disease. So this is the probability from, for a mosquito to get the disease from a human. This is the other way around. And these are the recovery, recovery rates. So what's happening is that mosquito just by the humans. And after that, if I can stop the animation, people just go back, go back home. And actually what's happened, the entire circles restart. So actually I have some parameters that define the disease and the other parameters that just define the mobility between, between, the, two, between the two things. What happened is that also in this case, I can write the equations. Again, I will not enter into the details because obviously it starts to be quite complicated, but the idea is that in this case, this is population, this is population I, these are the humans in population I. And so what happens is that I'm calculating the fraction of people infected inside population high. And actually I'm just calculating for the fact, for example, the fraction that was there, that lives there and doesn't get the, uh, it doesn't get cured in that uh, time step. This is the probability of getting the disease inside the same population. So staying at home, not traveling. And this is the, the probability of getting the disease from outside, so for example, from vectors that are in other populations, and so on. This is the same. Uh, this is the same equation for the for the vectors. The only thing is that actually I'm not. Uh, they are not traveling because we suppose they only move a few meters in their lives. So we suppose that vectors don't travel, and this is just the effective population. So the real population that lives in that is inside uh, a, a, a node. The number of people that is inside a node for a certain time of of time. So the idea is that you can solve this thing, even though it is quite complicated. 
The idea is just you calculate the steady state, you linearize as before, and the idea is by the linearizing you get these two matrices M and M tilde, where what you what you get actually these things just incorporate all the possible mobility that you can have. So actually what you are doing with this matrix, this matrix just incorporates the contacts between, in this case, between, human, between humans and mosquitoes. And then here you have the, the infection parameters, the parameters of the disease. So this somehow estimates the contact that you have and you multiply by the, by the let's say, the, the parameters of the disease and then you get the fraction of infected individuals, let's say. And this is the same thing for the mosquitoes. But, and then what happened is actually, okay, you can solve this problem. If you iterate this, this matrix, what you get? You get this M times M tilde. And in this case, what this is, the, this encodes actually the real contact, the contact between uh, two humans mediated by vectors. So how the disease can spread from one human to the other, passing by a number of vectors. And the idea is that after that, you can also, sorry, my screen is, going to sleep. Okay. Um, the idea is you can also get the epidemic threshold. So the minimum infectivity for humans that you need to spread the to spread the disease. And so actually you can study as these two things depends on the mobility, depends on P. Actually you can study how these things depend uh, how the how the epidemic threshold depends on the mobility and what you expect naively is something like okay I increase the I increase the probability of moving, more I mix people, and lower will be the, the epidemic threshold. So I have the probability of getting the, the disease. Uh, but actually we discovered that it's not, it's not the case. Things as usual are a little bit more complicated. Here what I'm plotting is the, the fraction of infected uh, humans in the system, summing all the different uh, populations of the system. In green, there is, no, there is no disease, and actually the epidemic threshold is this black line. And as you can see, actually it's not, the behavior is quite different. I mean, what's happened is that you have, a, you have a decrease, what you are expecting, then at a certain point you have a minimum, then it goes up again, then it goes down. And we tried to understand, we, I mean, it took some time to understand what is happening there, and actually we discovered that if you look at the single populations, here what I'm plotting is the incidence of the disease for each of the population. In this case, it was something like 50 different populations. So each line here is one different population. And what happens, what we discover is that as you change mobility, the fraction, the population that is, let's say, the most infected, the one that is leading the, the spreading, actually what happens, they change abruptly. So, for one regime of, uh, of mobility, what you get is just that is one, only one patch, the one responsible for the disease. Then what happens is that there is an abrupt change and then there is another one that is leading the, that is the most affected. And then uh, as you increase mobility even more, you start to see that actually more or less more, uh, almost, all the, almost all the patches start to get some, uh, start to get some, um, so, things. so actually what happened, this result is quite important for one main reason. Is the problem is that if you try, for example, to define a strategy to stop the disease, for example, I will just try to kill all the mosquitoes in one patch. This patch depends not only on the population on the patch, not only on the population of mosquitoes, of the flow of people coming in, but also of the actual mobility of the people, something that is really hard to estimate. So what's happening is that you start, for example, if you are in this regime, you can, for example, you are in the system in this regime, what's happening is that you say, okay, this is the patch that I have to, to immunize. For example, uh, trying to kill all the mosquitoes there, trying to delay all the sources of water that, that are there. And, thing. and then what's happening is that, for example, this was early in the morning, you make your counts early in the morning, then in the afternoon, what's happening is that the patch that is leading the spreading is absolutely another one. So, this is really extremely important because also another thing is that these patches are not the most populated, are not the one with the largest fraction of mosquitoes, are not the one, the most, the one with the most, let's say the larger, the larger mobility. 
actually they are a combination of both uh, of all these things together so it's really hard to predict which patch is the important let's say the relevant the relevant one for uh, for this thing and actually this is something that we try to do so what we tried to do here was quite simple in the sense that we try to estimate the epidemic risk of uh, of the disease just looking for example at the contacts between human so uh, you know that the the disease between human just goes from uh, one human to a vector and then to another human so actually what we are doing here we are trying to calculate the contacts between the contact mediated by vectors but from people uh, between people from population i to people from to population j so the idea is okay is it possible to estimate the risk without running all the all the simulations all these things just knowing for example the the mobility and the census of people is it possible to estimate this risk without running simulation on this thing and the idea is just with this thing with this uh, actually through these metrics just encodes all the possible contacts within populations and these are the four possible ways in where two individuals of different population can interact for example this is the case where they are in the same population so and nobody moves so they stay there and they meet just there uh, through a vector this is the fact that one moves and the other one stays at home this is the other way around and actually this is the fact that both meet in different locations so i'm from uh, i I go to K and then the other guy from J goes to K. We met there and actually we just transmit the disease to vectors. So what we did was just to try to create, just estimating the number of contacts between people from different populations. So for each population, we try to estimate the probability of getting the disease. For example, the incidence of the disease inside each population. And this is what we have done. So this is just this metric here. So we scale from one to zero. And this is the incidence uh, that we got from the simulations. This is the network. It's something like a Barabasi Albert network, a very small one. But this is what we this is what we got. Actually, without this is just estimating these matrices, and this one is running the simulation. So what you can see actually they fit quite well. So you are really able to predict these kind of things to predict, for example, the incidence of the disease, just looking at the mobility and the population without running anything else. But obviously this was just, let's say, just an example, okay? Everything is controlled, we are running simulations, we know the network, we know everything, we know the traffic to the detail. Let's say you can do something, let's say, stronger. And this is, for example, the case, what we tried to do was to apply this epidemic indicator just to a real case. So, for example, we got to the, to the city of Cali in Colombia, Santiago de Cali, as you can see, it's pretty, it's pretty nice between two, between two mountains. And the good thing about the city of Cali is that, first of all, it's large enough to have enough statistics about, the, about people living there. Then, one, another thing that we got, mobility data from, these are the districts, the 22 different districts in the city. They, they are called something like, in Spanish, they are called comunas different let's say large districts in the city and another thing is that they also run very accurate uh, surveys so they go to people and say about mobility so they go to people and what they say is something like okay where you go where do you live where you go to travel how many times which kind of the mobility you use for example you use buses all the other things and then they collect all these trajectories. And so actually what we have in this case, we have a detailed map of flows of people moving around the city. These are, these are real flows estimated from, uh, estimated from data. And so actually what we have, we have, the, we have the census and the mobility network inside the, inside the city. And the last thing that is also very good for us, but not so good for people living, uh, living in Cali, Actually, is that uh, also dengue, the other, another another vector borne disease, is um, there is endemic. So actually, each each line here is uh, different uh, is the incidence for different periods. So what you got uh, actually, they also got two real big outbreaks in 2000 around 2009, 2010, and around 2013. So actually, you also you also got detailed data about the incidence of uh, of the, the dengue in, 
then in Cali at the level of the single districts. So we can say, okay, here we have the, here we have, for example, this incidence and so on. So more or less we have all the ingredients that we need. And this is the, the ranked incidence. So actually we are scaling by the most affected area. So this area here, but this is the incidence inside the, the, inside the different districts of the city. And actually this is the, this is the prediction that you are, that you are making with just looking at the mobility and the census without any other, without any other input. And actually what we got is, okay, it's not as good as the other one, obviously, but it's still, for example, the, the important thing is that the ranking is consistent in all the cases. So what's happened is that you get that if you want, for example, immunize one area, this is the, always the, always, we always predict what is the area where that you have to, that you have to immunize. So actually, we are also trying to apply this thing to other cases where we have where we have data, but obviously it's not so easy because you need the data about incidents, about mobility, all these things. And with that, I think that let's say then we can stop. Just let me thank you, all these people. Actually, the people that work it, I just try to join them, as you can see, from time to time. So. Uh, it seems that worked because we got a couple of papers published uh, recently. These three guys are from the, from the University of Zaragoza, David Soriano, Adriana Reina, and Jesus Gomez Gardenas. Then there is FACTE, I think that right now is something like in PS, the CTP. And then there is Eliana and Hector, that are the guys that are working in Colombia, so they provide us all the data about, about mobility and the, and, uh, and the incidence of of them and I think the I'm more or less I'm finished. Thank you so much. Okay. Do, do you take questions, Sandro? Yeah, I think it's something like we have <laughs> we have 15 minutes. So if you want, I can take questions. <laughs> on the on the first part of your talk, the yeah. uh, the two diseases were uh, equivalent, right? Yeah. This is, uh, this is an assumption. Actually, the model works, for example, in this case, the model works even if the, the two diseases are not equivalent. Because here we have the two different, the, you can have different probabilities for different diseases. But the plots that I showed you, yes, we are assuming that everything is symmetric. And, and what happens if you do some form of symmetry breaking? If you look at that? Yeah, it depends on the, actually what happens is that it depends on the, on which, it, where you are. For example, if you are in the co cooperative regime, actually it's not so relevant because obviously uh, the final fraction of infected from each case will be different, but the results is more or less the same. So what you get, the total fraction of infected is more or less the same. But what happens is that it changes uh, the, let's say the fraction of each, each of the diseases. In the other things, actually, in the competitive regime, things are quite different because what happens is that there is a very narrow, let's say, the R0 of the diseases should be very similar one to another because otherwise what happens is that the one with the larger R0 takes everything. And, uh, but, it, but it's not, the, let's say, the range is not, it's not just exactly a line, it's just a range. So what's happening is that you can have in the long term, uh, for example, uh, for example, um, coexistence of two diseases that are not exactly equal, but they should be quite similar. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is more or less what happens. And this also can explain somehow how you have different strains of uh, the same disease that more or less have the same uh, have the same uh, R0. The only thing is that uh, from time to time, uh, one strain enters the system and can, for example, uh, erase the other one. For example, I didn't talk about it here. Yeah, I think that it's quite hard to see with this, this monitor. But what happened here, this was the, these are uh, two strains of type A seasonal flu. And this is the normal, let's say, H1N1, the normal one that was circulating in, in the world, around the world uh, before 2009. Then what happens is that, that the pandemic one, the pandemic version, let's say the mutation of H1N1, 
the one that is right now is still circulating is the one actually entered the system and totally destroyed this one because uh, because was something like a little more infective than the uh, than the previous one so actually what happened totally destroyed this this one is not circulating anymore and this one entered the system or probably it's not circulating we don't know exactly but more or less this is what happened so this is the result. You have a small range of uh, R0 where they can coexist. If one with larger than zero enters the system, it's gonna delete all the other ones. I don't know if I answer your question, Maxi. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Thanks. Okay. okay, then I saw Emilio that raised the end. Emilio. Hi. I, I'm <clears throat> in the case of a comp a competition between these diseases, okay. there is something I, I don't understand. There is a transition from uh, exclusion between the two diseases yeah. to, a, to a state in which the diseases are coexisting in the system, are in different holes, in different people, but they are coexisting yeah. in the system. I don't understand. Do you have any any intuitive explanation of this transition? Usually in yeah. this type of com competitive uh, systems, usually this happens when the um, competition with itself prevails over the competition with the others, but I don't see this in the question or in the model. Do you have an explanation for this? Actually, actually the explanation that we that we got just, for example, looking in the simulation and try to understand where, where the point is, the idea is pretty simple. The idea is that uh, what happens that when you are here, for example, I mean, your R0 is given by P divided by mu multiplied for your contacts. The contacts that you, for example, in this case is the, Let's say that is the average dv of the network, assuming that you have an homogeneous network. So your R0 is P divided by mu, multiply, everything multiplied by the average dv of the network. What's, up, what's happening here? Then uh, the fact that there is another disease there, so there are some nodes that you cannot enter, I mean, you cannot enter these, uh, you cannot enter these nodes. So what you are seeing actually that your average degree, the, the average degree that you are seeing, for example, the frontier between the two diseases, is smaller than the one that you will see if you, the one disease was spreading in isolation. So, what, so what's happening here is that you, here, your, the, for one of the diseases, the, the degree that you are seeing is something like it's smaller than, um, is smaller than uh, you, you need, for example, for having an, an R0 equal to one. So what's happening is that, for example, if I have uh, an infection probability of, um, infection probability of something like two, and um, a recovery probability, uh, recovery rate of something like four, and I have four neighbors, what happens is that my R0 will be, will be, I said something one. like eight. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sorry. Will be something around two, but if my degree is something like it's uh, the degree that I can see instead of four is two, my R zero will be one. So in this case, I cannot. Uh, in this case, I cannot. Uh, how do you say? I cannot spread the disease because I'm just below the threshold. What happens is that if I increase my P. My uh, my R zero the, the R zero that the, the both diseases are seeing it's larger than uh, than one. So what's happening is that I have coexistence. Even if what happens is that they are not. Uh, even if you don't have all the contacts, your overage degree it's uh, it's still uh, smaller than the, the original one of the network. What happens is that your R zero is is over one. And so this is the reason why there is this threshold at some point. I see it yet. looks quite dependent. Uh, so I think it's, it's an, a modern assumption in that you are spreading, you are concentrating your your spreading on the on the free links. Uh, pro yeah. I don't know if it, probably a, a disease will will spread randomly. Just it will not uh, end. It will not uh, prosper into into some nodes. But no, uh, actually, obviously, if you the thing is that uh, this thing happens. In the this thing happens, uh, for example, at the barrier where two diseases are. So the, obviously, if you are spreading, for example, in a spreading in an infinite network, what do you get at the end? That the both diseases they never reach, they never come in contact. So what's happening is that you you cannot see the effect. And also, this thing depends on the structure of the network. 
for example, if you are in a heterogeneous network that is that spread the disease more easily, this point is moving uh, more or less here. Actually, I think that a couple of slides of how this thing changes. No, it wasn't this one. It was this one. Yeah, this is how they change with the this is how they change with the degree. This is how they change with the structure of the network. For example, this is these are the two effects. Here we are using a model where uh, you have a parameter that allows you to interpolate between two different uh, two different types of networks. So if you have alpha equal to one, you you have an Erdos-Renge graph, and you have alpha equal to zero, you have a, a power law barabasi albert network. And actually, what happens is that this is the case of cooperation. You see that the jump becomes smaller and smaller once you reach the Barabasi network. And the same happens, this is, these are the three phases, the same happens also in this case for competition. So it's strongly dependent on the structure of the network that you're doing, but you, even, in, uh, even in heterogeneous networks, you still see these, these effects. I don't know if I answer your question. Okay. So that were something like some raised ends. I don't know. Okay. Pera, I see that you have a you have a question. Yeah. My question is in the example that you put at the beginning, when the two uh, of the two diseases that were say uh, helping one each other, HIV and tuberculosis. Yeah. Tuberculosis was already somehow ready, waiting there. I mean, you said yeah. that. It can be, you can have the, the bacteria or whatever sort of a serum for many years and just wait for an opportunity. So yeah, actually, to which point the fact that one of them is disease is always, is ready there to take over or, or, or the role that that has such a long incubation time plays a role in the dynamics? No, um, actually the, There are different things. Mm, what I showed you, the results, for example, the theoretical results, um, we you in for the theoretical results, we use the um, SIS model when you have an endemic state. So actually, it doesn't matter when the other one arrives. They can start. They can start together, or you can put first one and then the other one there, and actually, it doesn't change too much. Yeah. Obviously, if you are talking about with diseases that offer some kind of recuperation, for example. Uh, for example, if you are if you are studying an SIR, the time at which the disease enters is important because obviously the effect is going to depend on the incidence of the disease that is there. So if the disease is at the beginning, they can spread together, and the the disease is the disease is not uh, is just ending. Uh, the effect will be will be way way smaller. But I think. The thing is that in this case, this was something like the perfect storm because what happens is that you have a disease that is, is estimated to be in something like in one third of the population, but it's latent. Mm -hmm. And actually one third of the population, I mean, the vast majority of the population is never going to experience the disease because the immune system is going to keep uh, keeping it away for the entire existence. And then something like a 90, uh, they died for other, for other reasons, all these things. So, Actually, lots of people was there with the disease, but they were not developing the disease because it was latent. Then obviously, so what happens there was another disease that lessens your immune system goes there, and what happens is that this thing exploded. Mm -hmm. this, is the, this is the case, but this is a peculiar case because we have one disease that can wait something like 300 years before, uh, before starting, let's say before developing the disease. But obviously, other, in other cases, you can have uh, some, some sort of enhancement at the same time. There is no need for... Okay. Then I see that probably it was, was the... Here, <laughs> Emilio. <laughs> another so, question. Sorry, you didn't finish before. No, whatever. No, no, it's another question. You, ah, okay. You, you don't mind. The, uh, we have, I, we have I, time, I think that... Uh, the, could you? I, I don't understand very well the, the distinction you make between the mobility and the fluxes. How do you define them? Also, I don't understand the is the population of, of each meta of each patch constant or is it changing in time? So, I, could you uh, help okay, let me, spend let a little me, bit more? The, who is this model? Let, 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 me, let me go there. It's, oh, every time I put this animation, it takes forever. <laughs> Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so the idea. Let's go. Let's go here. 
So what do you have? You have here, you have different populations. So what happens is that you have, this population is bigger, for example, more, there is more people here than here, and also the mosquitoes are different. And then you have two things. First of all, you have a probability of moving. So a probability is saying which fraction of the population is moving, is leaving this, this population without uh, focusing on exactly where. And then you have a network, a weighted network that you can define, for example, from the data that defines the fluxes. So for example, you have, uh, for example, if you have something like six guys here and only three, three of them travel, so two of them goes to this one, one of them goes here and the other one, and the other one doesn't, uh, for example, doesn't travel. I mean, and, this, and nobody travels here, sorry. So you have the weather network that defines you where people move. So these are the flows and you have this probability defining you how many people. So, for example, this one define that half of the population gonna gonna move, and the way they are gonna move is according to these flows. And the That's population right. actually, what happens is that is you assume that every day is constant, but it's not only the population that you have here. The population that you have at the end is something like this one. You have people residing there that didn't move, plus population that comes from the other places. So for example, every day I go to work, I go to, well, I, I used to go to IFISC when it was allowed. <laughs> so the thing is that, what is the population inside, for example, in that area of the city? There is population living there, plus people commuting there, for example, every day, in for something like for eight hours a day. So for example, if you go to the equations, also if the mosquito stop, okay. If we go to the equation, actually what we did to define exactly, oh, sorry. This, this, these variables here, for example, this is the effective population that you can find inside the node, uh, node I. And the idea is that it's the population that you have in node I that is not traveling, so the one that they are staying there, and then the population from the other, uh, the other places that are traveling to I. So this is the probability of traveling to I, this is the the fraction of, this is the population moving, and then you say the fraction of people moving there. And actually what we are doing, we are doing exactly the same with the infected, the infected people that is traveling there. That is exactly the same thing, except for here you are multiplying by the probability of traveling of infected people. But I mean, but this is not a function of time, so it's, it's so after every day you reset the population yeah. to the original. Okay. Yeah, you assume that actually this is the this scale. Is. I mean, this is on a basic time step, what do you do? The population is this one. Then what's happened, for example, if you want to model, uh, for example, commuting, what do you do? Uh, you assume that your time step is something like three, um, something like one third of the day, just eight hours. So you assume eight hours, you have one population, then eight hours where people is not traveling because they are at home and so on. So, but the idea is that Every, every step, your population is, is constant, but it's not the one, uh, it's not like the census is. The census plus people traveling there. Okay. That's, that's the, I don't know if there are other questions. I don't know, I don't see anything, so. I don't know if there are no other questions as I am the boss, I'm gonna, I'm gonna I, call for now. I'm gonna call it uh, for now. Oh, also, you are, Maxi, you are clapping hands. Oh, cool. This day. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Grazie, Sandro. Uh, oh, okay, nothing. Thank you so much. Okay. Gracias. So, I Thank don't know you. if... Thank you. Thank you. So, I don't know, I don't know what's happening if something like, if uh, Ed was to stop the...